Hi, everyone. Welcome to our um, new webinar of the ESD Academy. My name is Lucille, and I'm a member of the ESD Early Career Academy Committee, uh, and I will be one of the hosts tonight. And um, I am the co-host for the seminar today. Uh, my name is uh, Rula Bani Bakar, and I'm also a member of the ESD Academy and currently doing a postdoc at Cambridge University. Welcome, everyone. We are very happy to have you all in today's webinar. And uh, today our guest is Professor Julian Zirat. Um, professor Zirat is um, professor at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, where she was actually my mentor. But she's also a professor and the executive dire director at the Center for Basic Metabolic Research at the University of Copenhagen. And um, Julian has been part of plenty of committee. And actually, she was one of the president of the ESD a few years ago, but today she's there to uh, talk to us about her experience in grant writing and also grant reviewing. So I think she will have a lot of experience that we can uh, learn from. And I will. Um, I think we would really like this format to be more of a discussion. So I will kind of encourage all of you maybe to put your camera on and to ask questions and really try to make that lively because that's really a good opportunity for everyone to ask all the questions you had and and that you would like to have like honest answer to. So, um, Trilin, we are very honored to have you tonight and uh, the floor is yours. All right, well, listen, it's a real honor for me to be able to meet you all today in this format. And Lucille and I talked a lot about, you know, how best to approach this opportunity. And I have made just a couple slides. I, I you know, I, I felt like all of you come at slightly different career stages and different experiences. And I thought I would just start out with some general ideas about grant writing. And I would approach it almost in two ways. I mean, one from the perspective of the person writing the grant, and then the other, which I think perhaps might be more informative is the perception from the person reviewing the grants. What do the reviewers look for? And I'm just gonna preface this with any of the comments I have are just my own. And it's, um, you know, I think that you know, it's just my own opinion. So you need to look at it that way as well. And you can probably talk to 10 different people and you're gonna get a lot of different advice. So please just take it with a grain of salt. And um, after these three slides and sort of set the stage, I would much prefer to have an active dialogue with, with many of you because grant writing is really pretty specific and it really is based on the grant that you're writing for. So if we can use this time to learn from each other, I think that might be useful for all of us. So with that, maybe I can share my screen and just show you a few slides that I have prepared. And let me see, can you see the slides? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, and I, I put it in here. presentation mode. Yeah, I'm going to do that in just a second. So, um, how does that look? Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so just some kind of general, general stuff. So before you get started, there's just a few things that you might want to consider, and um, the first, obviously, is just to develop a meaningful and an actionable plan for what you want to do. And, you know, I always think a good place to start with that is by having a lot of dialogue with colleagues around you and start to test some ideas. And, and you really need to get your thoughts down um, before you even approach it. And it might take you months before you really have a good idea um, on where you want to go. And obviously, you need to think about um, how your research plan is going to achieve positive results. And so you could kind of do some scenario building in your head before you even really start to write. You need to test the ideas in silico first. And, uh, you know, you need to find a grant organization or a source of funding that is going to be interested in the kind of project that you have in mind. And, you know, many foundations are very, very specific in what they want to fund in terms of the idea um, and the scope of the project. And it's important to pay attention to what's this foundation interested in. You know, obviously, if you're interested in doing diabetes research, you may not go to a cancer foundation. You may, but you may not necessarily do that. It depends on your research questions. So the foundations often have very clear 
areas that they're interested in funding. And, and, and you need to tailor your grant towards that, but you also need to make it very believable. And the research, you need to research that funding agency to make sure that their mission applies with your plan. And oftentimes grants can be triaged because the work you're proposing is outside of the scope of that foundation. And you know, if you're spending months writing a research application and the foundation isn't interested in funding that kind of work, you know, it really could be the best plan, but it won't go too far. Um, and again, you need to review the organization's proposal and guidelines and examine sample proposals, either from your department or your peers, or perhaps what that organization might publish, you know, what kind of work are they funding? So the first message would be, you know, develop an idea, but also find a match with a foundation or an association that's interested in the topic that you're, you're focused on. And kind of when you have that homework done, then you're really ready to start to draft that proposal. And so as you start to plan and draft your proposal, there's a couple things you should ask yourself. And you know, one, again, who's your audience? Who am I writing? Who am I writing my grant to? And um, one should think quite a bit about that. Who are the people on the panel? Oftentimes the panel members are published um, and, and you wanna tailor the grant towards the audience. Um, what are the expectations for the grant? You know, I think writing an ERC grant, a starting grant is very, very different than writing a grant for an EFSD um, emerging investigator award or a project grant. So what, what does that grant want to, what does the um, foundation or the uh, institution want to, um, what do they expect from you as the uh, writer of the grant? And you should think a little bit about how you establish your credibility as you're writing your application. And we can talk more about that in the different sections of a grant, but it's important for you to be able to convince the the reviewers that um, that you are actually someone that can um, deliver on the proposed work, and how do you and how do you do that? And then how can you clearly and logically present your plan? And I, I'll come back to that again because a clear um, communication of thoughts is essential, and a logic flow is really important. And I can give some examples of where grants have really been triaged because. The author of the grant is unclear. It's difficult to figure out the aim. Um, terminology can get mixed up a lot in the writing. And so I would say pay a lot of attention. You know, neatness counts a lot. And even if you think the grant might be logical, you should really pass it around to others who can read it. And they, they may not be as biased or they're not as close to the project and they can help you sharpen the logic of the plan. So my last slide is just general tips. Um, pay attention to the agency's key interests. You need to have an alignment between the work you're proposing and the people that wanna fund it. Um, organize your ideas and thoughts. And I just said numbered lists, but organization matters a lot for how you present a grant. Um, oftentimes reviewers of grants have a hundred grants to review for some foundations. And it might be that they have less than an hour to really look through your grant. So you have to really have the uh, exciting research jumping off the page at them. And you have to customize the proposal for the particular agency that you're writing to. And then go after all grants of all sizes. And I think that, you know, it may happen that your grant's rejected. You shouldn't give up because keep on writing. And um, you know, I've been in the field now since the mid 80s. And even at this stage in my career, I'm writing for grants all the time. And, you know, the success rate for grants is somewhat low. Um, some agencies fund 25%, some fund 8%. So I would say don't get discouraged, keep on writing and sharpening up the ideas. So those were a few things that I wanted to share um, initially. And um, I think it this point, I think I can open up for some questions if you have any here. Otherwise, I can go into some specific um, examples of, of different um, templates that we have for different grants. So Thanks, just... Dean. I actually have a very small question already, um, mm -hmm. and the audience can start getting ready with their own question. Uh, you can use a little, uh, you know, raise a hand button. 
Um, when you say, you know, to find the good grant organization, would you recommend sometimes to contact actually the grant manager? Because sometimes they have an email address. So is that good? Is that something we should do to write to them and ask, to, should we introduce ourselves? Is that something that people usually do or ask about this? I, th I think you can do that. Generally, people don't want to discourage applicants from submitting grants. So I think it's rare that they would say don't submit. But I do know, for example, I do know that there are some foundations. I know the Novo Nordisk Foundation has a call where they're funding research in the Scandinavian countries. And I know that they don't fund cancer. And so that is an area they do not fund. They fund diabetes, they fund uh, endocrinology, but they tend to not fund cancer. So, I mean, I guess you could say if I'm really outside the scope of a foundation, you could approach them and say, I know you're a diabetes foundation, but do you fund, do you fund Alzheimer's disease? You know, and they may give you some guidelines and say, no, we're not really focused on that. But this is a foundation that may focus on that. Mm -mm. Thanks a lot. Any uh, question in the audience? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so Julie, as a a uh, grant uh, reviewer and have been in the field for so long. Uh, what do you think is the most common mistakes in grant writing and how this can be avoided? I think that probably the, if from the reviewer's perspective, okay, I think one of the biggest um, uh, missteps might be time management. That perhaps when you write a grant, you underestimate how much time it takes to put in a really solid application. And so you leave yourself too little time to do the editing and to really read through the application and to um, pass it to other colleagues who can give you constructive feedback on your application. That would be another mistake, not sharing the document with other people around you to sort of get a reality check on the ideas. And so I would say that grants that are relatively easy to triage, and I, the reason why I say this is that uh, as a reviewer, for some foundations, as I mentioned, you could have upwards as 70 grants to review. And if I'm sitting uh, and reviewing 70 grants, and I know that we're only going to fund, you know, maybe 20%. So what is that? 14 grants right there. I'm spending a lot of time basically saying, which grants can I get rid of? Which grants are not interesting? You know, I'm spending a lot of time triaging applications. And so if I see an application where 80% of the application is an introduction and a background, and 20% is only the research strategy, that would be a grant I would triage. So I would say that was poor grants management on the author because they didn't really think about presenting the research strategy. They wrote just a review of the literature. Or if I read a grant and I can't clearly find the aims, if the aims don't just jump out at me and I'm reading the grant three times trying to say, what actually are they trying to address? If it's not clear to me in a, in a, in a one read of the grant, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just put that and triage that. So I think really paying attention to presenting the research in a way that someone can read it once and say, I understand what this person would like to do. And they can see that you have preliminary data and that you've laid it out in a way so that it's clear what you're trying to accomplish and you have a mitigation plan. That grant would probably pass the triage and that may get an even deeper dive. Does that help a little bit? Yep, that's very helpful. Thank you. And uh, we have a question from uh, Ellen. Hello, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask a question is like uh, uh, for an uh, early career researcher, like uh, usually for our first grant, usually like how we can choose which grant we apply and uh, is there any specific like a thing we can we need to pay attention to is like usually do we uh, need some like a other senior PI as our endorsement or as a, a co, co PI to apply. Thank you very much. All right, Helen, can you just tell us where you're working? Oh, I'm working in the epidemiology area. So and where? Like, where in the oh, world? No. Oh, now I'm working at the University of Leicester Diabetes Center. Okay. Yeah. All my, right. Yeah. Yeah, my area is about pharmacoepidemiology. Yeah. Okay. So th th there are, what, what is really nice is that there are grants 
that are funded at all different stages of our careers. And there are foundations that really particularly focus on really early career stages researchers where you don't have to compete against, you know, senior professors like me. And, and that's a great place to sort of get started because even small grants are important for your CV. Um, so I would say, yes, there are grants that are available for early career stage researchers. And then I would say you really have to read the instructions because it may be very clear that the award is for the early career stage investigator. And in that case, you certainly would want to, you would not want to have a co-PI as a senior investigator. So you have, it's all very specific to the, the foundation. But um, I would say it's important to have, if you're an early career stage researcher, you need to have support for the environment that you're working in. So if you write a grant, a grant is like a contract and it's an agreement with the foundation that you essentially um, commit to perform the work. And yeah. um, they will wanna see that you have the resources uh, mm -hmm. available to you to be able to do the work. And so you may have to have a letter from your supervisor that says that, you know, we highly support Helen. We think she's a promising researcher and we agree to provide the resources available for her to do the work. And mm -hmm. you may have some co-financing that might be your salary or something. And you can put that into the narrative. You okay. know, oftentimes in the background of the grant, you know, where you have to sort of say the, the very first part of the grant when you um, you basically do a write about the background. What is what is known about the question? Yeah. Sometimes I use that, even today, I use that area rather than reviewing the literature. I review okay. the literature that I've been involved in that leads me to the question that I want to address in the grant. And that might be a place where you can put in a sentence about, you know, I've been working on this problem and now within this research program, I'm going to try to solve the problem here. And you can describe in the grant the um, research environment that you work in, and it can be seen as a great strength that you're in a strong research environment at this early career in your stage. Okay. Thank does you. That, does that, does that, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we have another question from Sen. If you think can please unmute and uh, please introduce yourself and ask the question. Hi, Ilkya Sen from Karolinska Institute. I have a question. Um, um, regarding what you mentioned before a bit in detail um, about triaging, which part as a you know review committee or panel uh, member, which part do you think people get triaged the most? Like which part is the most important that you look at when you have a grant in front I of I guess, you? yeah, that, I mean, it's a good question. So honestly, the, the thing I really look at is the, the research proposal and how the research proposal is put together and um, whether the questions that are being asked are clear questions and whether or not the applicant convinces me that they can actually do the work, the feasibility. So if the applicant is proposing something that I don't believe that they can actually do, whether the scope of the work is too great or the methodology is just so far away from their track record, I may be skeptical. And if I don't see a mitigation plan, I may be skeptical. And I guess another worry I would have is that if every one of the aims is dependent, clearly dependent on the first aim, so that if the first aim doesn't work, then the applicant cannot do the second or third aim, I'd be worried about the feasibility of the project. And the way in which I get some um, feeling about the applicant is how they present themselves in the background. Um, so how do they review the literature and what about their career tra trajectory, you know, about what they have done previously in that first page or so when you're describing the background of the field. I want to see that somehow they've been involved in contributing to some of that work. It might not be that they're driving all the science, but they might have been in a research lab where they have themselves contributed to work that is important for the questions they're trying to ask. And then the other way I'd say that grant can be de-risked de is in the preliminary, um, preliminary results. And that's really critical, especially at the early stage, to be selective on the preliminary results that you put into a grant, because sometimes the preliminary results are there to strengthen the feasibility of the project, but they can also be there to demonstrate that you have expertise in an assay or an approach that you're proposing. And so it's there to convince me that you have a good plan 
that you have a track record, even at an early stage, to be able to address the question. You know, and then I do look at the CV, but I don't look at that first, actually. You know, I'll look at the CV to see whether or not the publication track does support the project. And if it's believable that the person who's applying has the ability to move this forward. So I, I think that, in, you know, even at a senior stage, that matters. Even at a professorial level, you know, when people are writing ERC grants, you're going to look to see, can they actually do this? And then the other thing would be the budget. You know, if you're proposing something where you need an army of people to work on the problem and your budget is only for two postdocs, I'd be concerned that the project might be unrealistic, particularly at an early stage in the career. But again, this is just my own, you know, somebody else might give you a different answer. So you always say it's more like the match between the project and the profile rather than maybe... Uh, or even if it's still important, the novelty or like the cutting edge technology, is that something that also... Well, I think important? those things are, should be there. I mean, the project should be novel. I mean, you shouldn't investigate something that's settled science and there's no more room to make a discovery, right? So I'm basically starting with the idea that the question you're asking does have some height. It should have height. Mm -hmm. And there should be some risk, obviously, but it shouldn't be that the risk is that you cannot do it. The risk should be the question you're asking. I, I think to some extent you should de-risk the project and be able to say, my team can address this. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes you have to realize as well that the people reading the grants, they may be, they may be specialists in the field of diabetes. And I'm using diabetes because you guys are all in the Diabetes Academy. So the reviewer might be somebody who knows the field of diabetes but they may not be an islet biologist or they may not be working primarily on liver or they may not be working on muscle or the question you're asking. So you have to kind of, you know, lift the question up to where somebody in the field understands it, but maybe they're not the expert in the field. And I would say another thing you should avoid is you don't use a lot of abbreviations in a grant, because if you're doing that, you assume the person reading it knows every nuance on your field. And they may not. So you should write a grant so that a generalist can understand what you're trying to do. Thanks a lot. I think it's very clear. And we have another question from uh, Richie, if you can also introduce yourself. Hi, yeah. Um, Richie Goulding from the Free University in Amsterdam. Uh, I've got two questions, but you, you partially answered my last one. But I just wondered how central do you view the pre preliminary data? And if you don't have strong data for an idea would you suggest not writing that grant how central is it for you I think it depends on where you're writing first of all I mean if you're going to write an ERC application for a starting grant and you don't have any preliminary data and you really haven't established yourself for your level in your field that might be tough right but I think for a lot of the starting grants that are from foundations um, your preliminary data could be important but you could also highlight, it's not really preliminary data, but it could be data from a paper you've published that's central to you moving to the next question. And so essentially it's not really preliminary, but you could say based on a previous publication that we have you know, published in the last two months, here it is, I'm showing you the, this is the figure I want you to look at. Um, we're gonna move the field forward. And um, preliminary data could be a Western blot of the protein you intend to study. You know, I mean, again, I said preliminary data can also establish that you're able to navigate the technique. Yeah. Cool, thanks. And then my second question was, you mentioned in your answer to the last question about the interdependence of the aims being a key red flag. This is feedback that I've also had on a on an unsuccessful grant, but to some extent, your aims stem from your previous work. So I struggle to understand how to tackle that in an application. And I wonder how you would suggest to deal with that. All right. So there's where I think you need to insert a mitigation plan into the grant. And so um, it, it, what would be probably of use or it would be of uh, help to the reviewer to see that you've thought through, you know, oftentimes you write a grant, and you say, we're going to do this and you assume everything's going to work out just great. And because you've done that, then you can do aim two, you know, but it might be a pitfall. Something might happen. And so when you start to talk through aim one with your colleagues, start to do the what if, what if this doesn't work? 
What if this doesn't happen? And then you can play some of that out in the application. And sometimes the reviewers just need to see that you actually have thought about the pitfalls mm -hmm. and that you can put into that a chart and say, basically, you know, one, one problem, one challenge might be that, you know, if you're going to do a chip seek analysis and the antibodies don't work, what are you going to do? You know, or um, I guess if you're going to make a knockout animal and, and, and you just have problems with it, what are you going to do? So I think you could start to play through maybe one or two, maybe three critical issues that you have to know yourself. Boy, if this doesn't work, the problem is just going to fall apart, the, the project. And put that in there and say, well, if this happens, we could do this or that or the other thing, you know. And then the reviewer can say, okay, Ricky has actually thought through this. It seems like he's got a plan. Hmm. But I mean, if AIM-2 is completely dependent on the success of AIM-1, that might be harder to convince. Oh. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> other, other questions? I mean, there's certain things you can think about when you put a grant together. I think a nice picture says a thousand words, right? Um, don't make the text so dense. Uh, try to be gentle on the eyes of the reviewer. You know, I try to have at least a visual image on every page of the application. Um, you can say a lot with a graphical abstract that kind of conceptually puts the problem together in a, a figure. You can have a picture that sort of shows the different aims and sort of the work around the aims. Um, again, showing some visuals of that you can actually master a metabolic assay and different cells or that you are able to transfect a cell or things that you can prove to the people that you have skills um, are helpful. Would you advise like a timeline, for example, to add or? Oftentimes people want to see a Gantt chart. Personally, I hate them. And the reason why I hate Gantt charts is that science is science and you don't always know that it's going to take two weeks or four weeks or a year to produce a result. But there are people that want to see that you've just thought through the time management issues. Um, actually, people look at your budgets. Uh, if a grant agency says that they'll fund an application up to 100,000 euro, don't go in with a grant for 50,000 euro, you know, or don't go in for a grant with 250,000 euro. You know, you can only get what you ask for. So if the foundation is willing to support your grant with 100,000 euro, put a budget together with 100,000 euro. If you put in a grant with a budget for 75,000 euro and they love your project, they're only going to give you 75,000 euro. So think through the budget. Um, I think that if you only ask for consumables and not people, that might be challenging. If you only ask for salaries and no consumables, that's challenging. So Maybe, you know, think about having, if you have a person, um, usually we say, let's say if um, 50%, if you have 100% cost for a person, 50% should be for consumables and 50% should be for salary. Well, it looks like you have hands to do the work and you can actually buy the reagents you need. Thanks, Janine. We have actually a question in the chat from uh, Aram. So first question is, uh, what criteria does the review use to avoid unconscious bias? while reviewing a proposal, if you have any information on that. Yeah, I mean, it is true that most grants provide a CV and in a CV, you see things about the applicant, you know, where have they trained? Um, what's their educational background? Oftentimes you see if they've had other grants, um, you know, even the ERC, they have the, the grant application forms are fairly detailed. In fact, with the ERC, 50% of the B1 is a lot of personal information about the applicant. You know, the top 10 papers you've published in your career, your, your things like your H index. But I, you know, I, I've seen extraordinary scientists with super track records who've gotten triage because they don't have good research questions. And so one has to focus on the science and the questions people are asking, but you do have to be able to believe that the environment that the person who's working in is able to support the work they're proposing. So it, it, it is a mix. We talk about it before a lot of grant panels. We'll talk about unconscious bias. I sat on a foundation where we, we discussed that before we even opened the grants. So foundations now are working to raise the awareness of the reviewers. It's, it's complex. Thanks a lot for this. So yeah, I think it's something that even uh, us as a committee, we always have in mind, and it's not always very easy to, to deal with. 
Uh, well, what I would say, can I make a comment? There was um, about 30 years ago, this sounds like a long time ago, there was a study that was performed in Sweden. Uh, a, a professor from Gothenburg University, Agnes Vald, she went and investigated all the grants that were awarded from the Swedish Medical Council at the time. Now it's the Swedish Research Council. She went and got all of the grants. She looked at all the grants that were submitted. She looked at all the grants that were funded. And then she did a breakdown on the scores for the funded applications and a breakdown of the amount of money that was distributed based on the score of the applicant. And I don't remember every detail of that investigation, but she found out that uh, fewer women were getting funded and that when women were getting funded, they had to score uh, higher than the than males and for the same level of points so if they got you know the same level of points the men always got more money than the women did and at least in sweden that put a huge uh spotlight it, on 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 the gender imbalance in funding research and at least in a country like sweden there has been a lot of emphasis placed on paying attention to that um that problem and there's been certainly some articles written about it. So I, I, I'm happy to see that foundations take this issue seriously. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have a second question, uh, which yeah maybe you have already a bit talk about, but uh, this person really wants to know what is the most crucial spot on issue that I can include in my proposal to catch the attention of the reviewer. I'm not 100% sure that I include in my proposal. I think it's more how to catch the attention of the reviewer. What is this thing that will like pops up and really make you feel this is good? Or I want to know more about this. I think the first thing, when you look at a lot of grants, you want to be able to see a grant that's clearly written and you're not using nine point font and you're cramming a pile of stuff in there. So honestly, just cosmetically, how an application looks, that's the first thing. That's the first impression you get with a grant. You look at the grant and then is it easy to follow the logic? Is the logic in the application clear? And generally I would say if you have a 10 page grant, usually the first page is almost like an executive summary and you should include some kind of a graphical abstract and you should identify the gaps in the field. What are the gaps? Be very clear, these are the gaps. And then how your proposal is going to try to address the gaps. And, and then I would say that a, a big percentage of the application should be um, you know, describing your strategy. How are you going to approach the aims in, in, so people can follow your logic? And so I, I, I think there you should have about maybe 60, 60% of the application should be really on that strategy because that's what they're going to fund. That's the work. And then I'd say 20% of the app, the grant should be on preliminary data. You know, something that supports um, your ability to do that work. And so a grant that is 90% of the background and only, you know, 10% of the strategy is something that doesn't impress people. But managing, managing the, um, Managing the writing, I think, is a, a, an important thing. I mean, without getting into the specifics of the question, I mean, that's difficult to discuss here because that's the kind of conversation you have with your team and, you know, your the people around you who know your area of science. But, you know, presumably you've got a question that you've presented maybe in lab meetings or um, in groups where you've tested the tested the idea that this is worth worth moving forward on. And um, a bit follow up on that, but I was actually wondering, of course, we are more at the junior level, so it will be like starting grade on postdoc. And there is always a bit this question of, as you say, how much can we do by ourselves? And how much can we propose a collaboration? Is that something that you will recommend? Because of course, you can show that the environment will be there for you. But I think it's also the limit of showing you're not too much relying on maybe someone else's expertise. So how would you... How would you rate that as a reviewer? How do you integrate this in the grants? Um, it, it, so some grants have sections where you can talk about your research environment, but you can actually you can actually put that in. You know, that's a part of the feasibility. And um, I think be very clear on on writing down where your independence is and what you bring to the table, 
and how you really are working. You know, here's the other thing. Reviewers can see through things that are not true, right? So, I mean, they can actually see where you're really demonstrating something that's truthful and perhaps where you're embellishing on the truth. So I would say just be really truthful about the environment you're working in. And you'll hopefully be able to show that by abstracts you've presented and papers that you've published along the way. I think that's a very good advice. I don't know if you have more questions. Do not be shy. You can also use the chat uh, if you don't or you cannot really speak right now. Um, Rula, I don't know if you have another question waiting for our audience to... I mean, the other thing I'd say is that, you know, I mean, you know, all right, even at the, at the professorial stage, you get grants rejected, you know. Um, I did all the wrong things last year when I put in my ERC grant. I, I wrote the grant in five days. Should never do that. I submitted the grant. I knew the grant wasn't right. It wasn't perfect. I didn't have a chance to kind of circulate it and really refine my ideas. Um but although I believed in the idea, the grant went past the triage. Great. I gave the interview. I felt that went well, but I, I, I didn't get the grant and there were problems with the application. Right. So then what I did was I had about two months and I sat down and I really reworked the grant and I sent the grant out to other peers who work in my area. And I asked them to just beat up the grant, just destroy it. Tell me everything that's wrong with the grant, what you don't like about it. And I took their feedback and I had the reviewers comments from my round of ERC and I revised the application and I sent it in again. And I, two weeks ago, I got the letter that it's gone past the triage and I'll have an interview in January. So I would say, don't be discouraged. And sometimes, you know, when you get to a certain level, it is a bit of a crapshoot because there's a lot of really good applications out there. So I would say, don't give up continue to work on your questions and continue, if you believe in it, to um, ex advance the project. Thanks. We have one question from Tina. If you can um, hi, um, thanks for a nice presentation. Um, I have one question. So I'm beginning with my postdoc and it is in a completely different field, which means that I only have the publications from my PhD that are, of course, like not in this field. And when you're applying for a grant for this postdoc in the new field, you're of course not so versed or don't have that much idea. Um, however, the project is sort of um, established in the lab or the, the idea is there and you bring some of your ideas into the project and then you submit it. Um, how, how much attention is actually paid to the, um, to the previous publications and um, like at this point, of course, like you're not as versed as others in this field, but is it appreciated this change of field and uh, bringing sort of the ideas of the other field to this one and stuff like that? Uh, what would be your comments on that? So, yeah, you. so I, I think you have a really um, excellent opportunity when you're writing the grant and you're sort of in the very beginning of the grant, you talk about the background in the field, but some of that background in the field should be why you're best suited to take on the challenge, the project. And I think, you know, when you write that, you can, it, they'll see that you've worked in a different field, acknowledge that. Yes, I've worked in this field, but you're still bringing uniqueness to the project. And whether it's your skills in biochemistry or molecular biology or tissue culturing or in vivo physiology and animal models, Whatever that might be, use the opportunity to present some of the um, uniqueness that you bring to this this question, you know, and you can acknowledge, yes, I might have worked in this field, but because of that, it's given me a different lens to look through to the to the question. And I think people appreciate that when they read when they read the grant. And as you're writing the project, you probably have got some experience in some of the things that you're going to be proposing. Take the opportunity to show people that I've worked on this, yes, another field, but I, I mean, tissue culture is tissue culture. It doesn't matter what field you work in, right? A lot of animal handling, very similar between different disciplines. So don't under um, don't undervalue all the experiences you've had. Use them to show how good you are for the for the questions you're asking. Thank you. And can I have a follow up here? Um, how much does the experience from outside of the um, research counts 
I know I'm working, um, I was working in a startup before that was sort of being in the field that I'm researching now. How much is this appreciated? Because it doesn't yield publication, it does yield experiences and research ideas, but it doesn't. Well, again, have yeah. Like so you, 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 you worked in pharma. A, have you worked in pharma? Is that what you're saying? No, I, I was working in a um, nutritional coaching. I, I couldn't hear what you said. You were working where? Um, nutritional coaching oh. startup. Well, I think, you know, I would I, I wouldn't back away from it. I mean, you know, that gives you the ability to address questions that will have some um, public health benefit. Right. I mean, every 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 grant has the last part of the grant where they want to know what's the impact of the society. What's the impact of the work? Right. Um, there's always that last part of the grant, you know, and um, there's where you can say, you know, I've had a, a long career in, I don't know, nutritional sciences. And you can use that when you talk about how you can take your basic science question and have an impact on society. And um, I mean, every single thing you've done in your CV is always a thing you can lift forward because it makes you strong. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, we have another question from uh, Richie. Yeah, thanks. Um, so you mentioned about the importance of keep like just keep going, even at the senior career researcher stage, you still get rejections. And I guess I just wondered what, what is the kind of ratio of funded to uh, not funded grants that one can expect at the senior researcher stage? And I, I guess the reason I'm asking is because I get the the idea from a lot of colleagues that it is just potluck and there's a big element of randomness to it. But then I guess we wouldn't be having this discussion if it wasn't a skill that you could develop. So yeah, uh, yeah. do you have anything to say about Well, that? I mean, random, random. I think to some extent it's, it's easy to say things are random. You know, I just mentioned before that, you know, my grant, I know there was problems with my grant, so it wasn't perfect, you know. And when it didn't get funded, of course you're always disappointed when a grant doesn't get funded. But I, I when I read the reviewer's comments, for me, I'm like, yeah, it made sense. You know, they they weren't wrong, you know. Um, so I would, you know, I don't have numbers on how many grants do you have to write before you get a grant accepted. But I just, you can't give up. Um, and sometimes it's depressing because um, probably more grants get rejected than get funded. And if you have an idea that you believe in and if you keep working to de-risk the project, you know, it will get to the point where you've got all this stuff in place. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to do a lot of experiments even that you're proposing. Um, and that's where you sort of de-risk it as well. But, you know, but um, I guess you just cannot personalize it if a grant is rejected. You have to learn from it and say, I must have got it wrong. Either I didn't explain it right. It was clear to me. And that's why sending it to other people and getting a different perspective is usually very useful. Do you see a difference now in compared to the start of your career? Do, do you, would you say that you have more successful ones now? Uh, have you learned over time or? Um, I think it's just as hard as when I started, to be honest. I mean, the problem you have now is that the grants are bigger and you have more mouths to feed, right? So, I mean, there's where the stress comes in, I guess, if I'm going to be really honest. But I feel like it's about the same. Um, and um, I don't know that it's, I think it is just, it is hard to get grants funded. That's a fact. And I think it was hard to get grants funded when I started. So I don't right now feel like it's easier, but I think I've spent more time trying to understand how to de-risk the project and put elements into it to um, show the reviewers that I've thought through where the where the potential problems are. Maybe I didn't do that as much in the beginning. Thanks. Yeah. I, it's, not so, it's just a, you know, I'm sorry if I'm not so clear, but it's hard to go back and address that. I just think it's always been hard, but it's still fun. I love writing grants. I mean, I love being able to kind of put the ideas down there and test it and say, well, this is what we want to work on. Thanks. We have another question from Peter. Hi, Peter, um, from Karolinska Institute of Sweden. Um, could you touch a little bit upon this catch-22 that kind of uh, we we are in, in an early career stage where um, we don't have much funding, 
a lot of funding sources come with a comment. It happened more than once to me that, oh, the applicant hasn't attracted a lot of funding. I've practically funded my four-year postdoc at Stanford, almost attracting four million Swedish crowns. And I keep getting this, this comment on my grants that I haven't attracted a lot of funding. Uh, what what is sufficient amount of funding to kind of show that you are actually you're actually doing your you're putting in your work attracting the funding but now you need to take the next step you have to both show your independence from a research group but also from your postdoctoral uh, supervisor and obviously there might be a change in the project there and for the project that I'm applying for right now no. I, I only have smaller grants right now. That's mm -hmm. true. I think it's how you write that in the beginning. Like I said before, you have this sort of, well, when I first started writing grants and they have the beginning where it's sort of the background of the field, you know, you sit down and you write the background of the field. You know, my field is glucose transport. I talk about when GLUT4 was cloned. I talked about GLUT4 translocation and it was very generic, right? I, that's how I wrote the background. And at some point I stopped doing that. And I started talking about the background of my career and what I had done along my academic journey to get me to where I was today. And so some of the text I, I, I put in the early grants with, you know, with, with funding from X, Y, and Z, I did my postdoc at LMNOP. And, you know, you can write that into this background to sort of give the narrative of your career and, and spell it out to the, spell it out, you know, that, don't just take it for granted that if it's a line in your CV that says, I've got a grant from this place, everybody's going to notice it. Because for some people, the last thing they look at is your CV. So you can pepper the grant with saying that, you know, with funding from this foundation, we were able to solve this part of the problem. So you can sort of build that narrative. And I don't think it's hubris. I don't think it's inappropriate to do that. It just establishes your credibility. Um, and it, it, I being more clear about where your journey was is a part of the application as well. And I think you can do, you can write that into the application. I don't know if that makes sense, Peter. It definitely does. Uh, I actually haven't thought about including um, explicitly grants in, in the background that I, I'll, I, I can try. Well, if it's a key one, if it's a key grant. Of, you... of course it is. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then you can have a section in the grant about um, resources and environment that you're working in. Mm. And you can describe there about your group, even if it's a small group, you can say, I've supervised three master's students. I'm co-supervisor on two PhD students. And my team is working towards something. And then you can you could say, although I'm working close to my, my previous supervisor, I am distinguished from them because I work on this. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Thanks. I would say don't take it for granted. If there's something you want a reviewer to know, you need to write it into the application. Great. Thanks. I mean, again, remember, a reviewer might only have one hour, one hour to read your grant, look at your CV, try to figure out what's this guy trying to do? Is it worth funding? And you have to make it crystal clear to them because then they'll flip to the next one. They have so little time to read these things in the first pass. And so stuff has to jump off the page. Thanks a lot. I don't know if we have some last question from the audience. No is your time because we have around uh, 10 minutes left. I have- Yeah, so uh, what have I missed? I mean, what haven't I talked about that I should talk about? I don't make, the C make the CV something that they can really see the highlights. Um, no grant is too small. No presentation is too little. Um, try to keep a good record of uh, students that you've supervised. Um, and again, look at the foundations for what they're, sometimes they want you to format CVs in certain ways. They want you to format grants in certain ways. And every one of them is different. I spend most of my time reformatting stuff. Do you think there is some grant that maybe also want us to talk more about mentorship but also like reaching to the public is it something that we should try to add on or is it more like on the side and not really something that they care or 
I think that matters a lot for your promotion within a university, but I think that research funders want to see about the research strategy that you're trying to approach. What's the question? How are you going to do it? Do you have the resources? Are you the right person to do it? They're less interested in about public outreach for a research grant. But if you want to get promoted in your faculty, it probably matters that you have a social consciousness and you're disseminating science to the lay public. Another question from Richie? Yeah, sorry, I have a lot of questions. But, That's um, perfect. <laughs> I just wondered how important is it to have a novel technique in your grant? Because you mentioned novelty is important. But I always, in my training, I was taught that the questions should define the techniques and not the other way around. But then I've had a lot of feedback saying there's no new novel techniques in here. So can you comment on the, the balance to strike between those two things? Please. Um, I think the question is personally to me the most important question. I mean, uh, the, the important aspect. And I, I also, for me at least, I, if you can answer the question with a conventional technique and you can advance the field, that should be good enough for me. That's just me. Um, so I'm not someone that's really interested in all these flashy things. But of course, if you have something that's an advanced technique, you couldn't have that in every single aim, but or if you're going to develop a resource, I, I think people are excited about that. But you can't get away from a good question. I think you have to have a good question first. I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure what kind of techniques they're asking you to do, but um, basically, just can I get funded without doing omics? <laughs> oh well, here's the thing. I actually the problem with a lot of the omics based grants get triage because people don't think about bioinformatics, right? So there be a lot, there are many people that propose a lot of omic, 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 and they don't even bother to describe how they're gonna interrogate the data. And so I can say that that can be a death nail for a lot of grants too. If you haven't thought through how you're gonna manage the data and how you're gonna handle it. So um, I don't think you have to have a bunch of omics to get a grant funded. Thanks. It, That's really could, it could actually work against you if you haven't thought through it well. Sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so I have one uh, more question. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think are the current trends in grant writing, like, for example, using artificial intelligence and helping us writing grants? Um, do you recommend that? Are you against this? So what are your views in this part? Well, I don't know, but I love to write. So, I mean, I, I can't imagine... I'll, I'm so old fashioned, so I'll probably always write a grant. Um, I, I I don't have a comment because it hasn't occurred to me to even do that because I really, really enjoy writing. Um, but so I, I, yeah, I don't have a... about AI in academia. So I was wondering if that is also like not recommended in grant, grant writing. I don't really have, I'm going to, I'll be honest and say, I don't have a comment about it. I, I, you know, I, it has never occurred to me to do that. So on a personal level, it's something I wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think writing is still important. I, I enjoy that part for myself. Um, I suppose there'll be more and more people who approach that. You're still going to have to do the work. You still have to do the experiments. You're still going to have to go in and produce data. So that's going to be the one of the most important things. So even if you have an AI generated grant, you still have to be able to prove that you can do the work. Okay. Thanks. If we don't have more questions, maybe we go more into some concluding remarks if you have. I was actually uh, thinking about something that I think I uh, may have learned for you, Jean. Uh, it's also that sometimes it's also, I mean, of course, we're talking about grant writing, but I know that uh, I, as a postdoc, sometimes limit myself thinking that I couldn't have a grant and then I shouldn't apply. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think you told me sometimes that I should apply and I had a chance. And I think it's it's uh, uh, an advice that I will share with others that um, for some of the EFSD grant, for example, sometimes don't hesitate and just submit a project and and you, yeah, you will see if if it's good enough and if you can have it. But maybe sometimes it's good to not get stopped by uh, the wording of the grain that always says that you have to be excellent and cutting edge and that you can have a chance and and you should just try for it. Yeah. 
Well, you know what, um, Lucille, I think that's really good advice because it's not, it's, it's a whole process. It's the generation of the ideas. It's discussing the ideas with your team. It's starting to put the words down on paper and think through the, you know, the um, thought experiments. You know, if you're thinking through the experiments, uh, de-risking the project, um, generally getting other people involved in it. So to me, it's it's not just writing the grant, but it's the whole experience of that that helps you mature and helps you move the idea, helps mature the ideas. And if you get the grant, that's fantastic. But if you don't, you can still go back to the idea and help mature it more. So I, I think you can continue to evolve the projects. You should never wait. You should start now. I think that's a very nice concluding remark. I don't know if you have anything else uh, to add or- Well, don't, yeah, don't get discouraged. And, um, you know, again, it, 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 don't get discouraged, continue to work on the network and um, don't be shy to ask people to take a look at the, the grants as you're going along um, because they may give you advice that will make the very big difference for you. Oh, another question. Yes. One yes. Last. Thank you very much uh, for the whole discussion. Uh, now it popped up a new, a new question for me based on what you said about how important it is to go through the guidelines, so to speak, of the grant organization. And also Ricky, I think he mentioned how if we can get a grant if we don't have omics, for example. Do you think or do you feel that um, this generation of ideas sometimes should be biased of what is hot in the field, so to speak, that uh, some uh, research questions might be more uh, in fashion than others and we should aim for these? Um, well, that's a tough question. Um, I think you need to follow things that reflect your own scientific curiosity and interests, right? Because if you if you don't, it's not going to be believable. So, you know, you need to build upon your experiences and hopefully the question you have is something that is close to what you've been able to work on and that you're moving the field forward in a different direction. You know, um, I think just kind of like, it would sort of be like me jumping into aerospace because I think that's kind of cool. Nobody's going to believe me that that's, or, you know, even we talked about AI, no one's going to believe me that I'm going to develop a project on AI, even though I think it's kind of cool stuff. I'd have to spend a good year de-risking the project and trying to, you know, develop the infrastructure and recruit some people to help me approach that problem before I'd write a grant on that because people won't believe it. So I think, you know, try to work on what you're able to sell and in parallel work on things that are going to move you to a new different direction. And when you talk about guidelines, I just pulled down this. This is the EFSD grant that's due December 1st, 2023. It's like 20 pages of instructions. They spend a lot of time telling you what you can and can't do. So start reading the instructions to the grants before you even start. And um, that, that'll that help you sharpen up the ideas and put the project into place. Thanks a lot, uh, Jean. I don't know if you have time for a very, very little last question in the chat. Oh, sure. Um, it's from Elisa saying that in a proposal she submitted a few months ago, uh, for an early career grant in her CV, a paragraph was asked about the contribution or the connection with society or the community. And she asked if you know which activities could be appreciated. That's a, that's a question you had. So, I mean, I said before that every grant is different and every grant specific, right? So um, without knowing what that foundation is looking for, it's hard for me to answer that question. So I imagine, I don't know, it could be, did you... Did you make something that society is using? Did you make a, a a textbook? Did you make a an app? I, I I'm not really sure what the grant foundation is. I don't know, so, if Elisa. You want maybe to clarify, or if you have a more specific question that not to put you on the spot. Well, I think again, <laughs> it is. It, it really comes down to the kind of the headlines that the foundation's asking for in the application. And if they're really translational, it might be that they want to see if you have an application or if you have a, a teaching method or if you've taken your research and you've, I don't know, maybe you've studied a device or something. But I, I, again, if you have to pay attention to what the foundations are looking for in their grants.
perfect. Thanks a lot, uh, Julian. And, uh, all right. Well, good luck to all of you. You guys are the future. Oh, I look okay. forward to seeing um, all the banners at the EFSD with the grants that you've all received. So <laughs> good luck going forward. That would be Take amazing. Care, everybody. Bye. Well, Thank really you. Good. Thank you very Bye. much. Thanks. And uh, I would like to remind everyone uh, that we have other activity from the ASD Academy. So do not hesitate to look at our list of webinar and uh, next journal club because um, we're always very happy to to get more feedback and uh, more involvement for all of you guys. Uh, yeah, Hula, do you want to add something? I will just I would like to thank Professor Jeline Zira for her insight and advices, which have undoubtedly uh, enriched our understanding of the process of grant uh, writing. Also, thank you for all the participants for the engaging uh, questions. Uh, please, if you have any feedback, we will come uh, them to make a future event even more impactful. Um, thank you so much and have a nice evening.